welcome to Regrettable Superhero of the Week, the not weekly weekly show where I pick one character out of the League of Regrettable Superheroes and then I run them down. Before you say it, I know, I'm doing this one on Monday instead of Sunday, but that is because yesterday was Halloween and I wanted to let the Halloween special sit and simmer for a little bit. I wanted you guys to enjoy that for a little while. But in celebration of the last day of spooky season, which I refuse to admit that it is no longer spooky season, November does not exist, October just has 61 days. But in celebration of it, I wanted this Regrettable Superhero of the Week to actually be the Regrettable Supervillain of the Week. So, without further ado, let's get into it. Ignore the fact that my sheets don't exist, I'm doing laundry. Let's see who our supervillain is today, and you. The... the jingler? The jingler? Oh boy, I don't know if anybody has told you this, but you're supposed to stop at the edge of the page and then transfer down one line, not just right across the entire fucking book. So I don't know about, like, supervillain, this guy's just kind of a serial killer. The jingler, created in 1942 by Top Notch Comics, is the supervillain of The Wizard and Roy the Superboy. His real name is Edward Fearing, and he is just a notoriously terrible poet. However, he has chosen his profession to be a poet, so he keeps trying to get his work published, which it doesn't. In fact, essentially, every single publishing house basically tells him, just fuck off, this is, this is shit, man, God. In fact, he gets so down on his luck that he ends up trying to steal from a shopkeeper, who catches him and he accidentally kills. However, when he fucks off, he completely forgets to notice the fact that the shopkeeper had grabbed one of his terrible-ass poems and is holding it in his now-dead hand. And when the reporters find the body, they publish the poem, because that is a hell of a calling card. But you see, Fearing isn't particularly picky, so he counts that as published and decides that that's how he's gonna get his work published now. Murder! Apparently the reporters in this town are terrible at naming things because he is then named The Jingler. He then proceeds to murder just a fucking gaggle of high-profile publishing mongols that just apparently all live in this town. This is a really good town for publishing. And every time he leaves one of his terrible fucking poems on their body. And he is fucking brutal with these murders. One of the fucking publishing mongols said that if this is poetry, I'll eat it. So the way that he kills him is stuffing a bunch of his poetry down his fucking throat. Yet. That is until the wizard and Roy the Superboy hear of the terrible Jingler, and using their patented super brain, they deduce the fact that the next person on his hit list is a very well-renowned poetry critic who is about to critique the Jingler's poetry on air, on TV, because that's not a way to get a target painted on the back of your fucking head. You know, the Joker, he's been a real, real problem murdering a lot of people in Gotham the last few days since he broke out. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go on the air and I'm going to critique his fucking comedy. Anyway, Wizard and Superboy stop the murder and end up chasing the jingler out into the streets. That eventually leads to the side of a fucking cliff and then off of one. The Wizard and Superboy are fine. The, the, the jing jingler, jingler's not. And when he dies, one of his poems falls out of the air and lands on his chest. Reading, life quickly cools and poets and fools. One more life, my friend, is approaching its end. Yeah, so I don't think that I am incorrect in assuming that this only lasted one issue. Maybe the reason his poems suck is because he doesn't know how to fucking write! You know what we don't talk about, like, nearly enough? The fact that Martian Manhunter's literal, actual fucking origin story is jump-scaring a motherfucker to death. Like, yeah, there's some intense fucking war shit before that, but, like, the reason he's stranded on Earth to begin with is because he jump-scared a motherfucker to death. So yet, yeah, like, completely unrelated to all of, you know, the war shit that was happening to John Jones on Mars, Dr. Th th this joke's punchline was supposed to be that I was going to look up the name of the doctor in, in The New Frontier, but they don't actually say it in there, so Doctor, whatever the fuck his name is, was literally just trying to bounce a radio signal off of Mars. Send, receive, that was it. And accidentally teleported a whole ass dude, which was so fucking terrifying that he just up and fucking died. Straight up just stranding an alien on Earth with no idea how the fuck to continue. I think after that that Jean thought that if he showed his face to anybody that he would just straight up fucking kill him. I was like super confused when it didn't. I think about that more than I should. Y'all have a nice night. These posts are adding fuel to the fire that there's a David Ayer cut of his Suicide Squad movie. No! We just fucking fixed this! I don't care if Jared Leto was fucking possessed by the ghost of Heath Ledger and voiced by Mark Hamill! I don't want to see that Joker again! I already did my fucking time! You can't take me back to that shit! Sometimes you just gotta admit that the movie was bad! Was there a bunch of studio meddling? Fuck yeah! Am I sure your vision was different? Absolute! Do I have insane respect for artist integrity? Of course I do! But if I have to hear that creaky door ass laugh one more fucking time, you cannot make me care about an air cut. And I see you looking at that four hour fucking Snyder cut, don't you fucking think about it! There are a few performances that are so bad that they make me hate an actor, but that Joker is one of them! So yeah, I, 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 I don't want it. I, I, no. Thank you for coming to my fucking TED talk. 
Do I have enough time in my schedule to make a video today? No. Am I currently running on no hours of sleep? Yeah. Do I have homework that's not done that is due in about an hour and a half? I'm not gonna answer that because my mom watches these. But do I wanna do it though? No. So with all that in mind, uh, welcome back to Regrettable Superhero of the Week, the weekly, not weekly show where I pick one character from the League of Regrettable Superheroes and then I run them the fuck down. Let's see who our superhero is today, shall we? Alright, let's see. Any, mini, miny, you. Kid Eternity! That is a surprisingly awesome name for probably the most boring cover I've ever seen of a comic book. Also, you know, just like, fuck saying what month it is, just spring. Spring in general. Apparently the Statue of Liberty's lazy-ass cousin lives in the clouds with, I don't fucking know, Timothy Chalamet with the fashion sense of the 90s over here. Where the fuck did I find another character in this book that revolves around ghosts in World War II? Kid Eternity debuted in Hit Comics number 25 in December of 1942. He was created by Sheldon Maldoff and Otto Binder, the same guy who was behind Supergirl and a good portion of the Marvel family. Okay, so get this. In the world of Kid Eternity, everybody's death is preordained. There's also a good place named Eternity and a bad place named Stiga. Stigia. Stigia. This. Anyway, his story starts out with him sailing his cargo ship with his grandpa. Then all of a sudden, a twisty X U boat shows up and just fucking blows it the fuck up. Killing just everyone inside. All of a sudden, Kid, by the way, name's never given, he's just Kid. Kid and his grandpa and all of the men on the boat are in eternity. Here's the thing, Kid's grandpa and all of his men, they, they just get to go on to the afterlife. They, they were destined to die on that cargo ship. That was already fucking decided. But, uh, due to a clerical error, Kid, kid wasn't supposed to. So essentially, Eternity pays him off? Let me explain. They send him back down to Earth into his mortal body, which is not a small thing. He died in the ocean. They needed to recover his fucking body. Anyway, they return him to his mortal body and allow him to just, you know, keep living. However, they also give him insanely powerful superpowers. If he says the word Eternity, he can turn back into his ghost form and just basically has endless superpowers. It's literally just described as feats of pure magic, so, you know, just anything you can think of, as well as the ability to summon the ghosts of other figures from history and fiction, apparently. Later, his powers got reduced back down to, like, just a ghost and the summoning thing. But even then, he could summon, like, Paul Bunyan, Hercules, like, those type of people. Oh, and his sidekick is the dude who fucked up and got him killed in the first place. That's Friar Tuck if he joined the Blue Man group over here. Apparently, Kid Eternity was, like, actually a pretty popular character. Like, his book ran into the early 1950s, like, over eight years. Some of his villains had their own spin-off books. Hell, this character's been revived a couple of times. I mean, honestly, if you get a talented enough writer, I think that you could probably do something with this character. So yeah, not actually immensely regrettable. A little weird, but not super bad. At least in comparison to, like, B-Man or Speed Centaur or something like that. Alright, I actually wasn't joking about the homework. I gotta get out of here. So one thing as a comic fan that I really like to see is interpretations of characters changing over time. Think about, like, Batman starting as a really obvious pulp hero to start with, but then The Dark Knight Returns happens and all of a sudden he's a dark, gritty vigilante with a lot of issues. Or, like, Peter Parker Spider-Man going from, like, lovable everyman college student to now he's the mentor of multiple other spider people. One of my favorite versions of this, though, is Nightwing, actually. Because for anybody who just recently started getting into Nightwing as a character, you might not know that for a pretty long stint of the comics, Dick Grayson was kind of an asshole. Specifically, Dick Grayson Nightwing was kind of an asshole. I know that's kind of hard to believe now because his modern interpretation is kind of like the, the lovable Robin, the nice Robin, the one who makes quips and is like the mom friend. But let me just give some examples of Dick Grayson being early to mid 2000s pre-New 52 Dick Grayson. There was that time that he was stranded on an island with all of the titans and he fucking blew up an entrance of a cave and locked himself inside just because all the titans kept comparing him to Batman. After he accidentally killed the Joker in the last laugh, Barbara came to comfort him because he was obviously feeling pretty shit about killing someone. And not only was he just a complete jerk to her through the entire conversation of her trying to fucking comfort him, he ended the conversation by saying, don't make me sorry I had an elevator put in this building. Fuck, dude. Oh, and we're not done with him being an asshole to Barbara Gordon just yet. The way that he decided to tell her that him and Starfire were going to get engaged was by sleeping with her and giving her the invitation to the wedding the next morning. 
for real, fucking good, good dude. Prina 52, Dick Grayson, ain't he? I'm very happy that the modern interpretation from the writers and the fans of Dick Grayson is very much more along the lines of, like, quirky mom friend. Like, don't get me wrong here, I still hate the new 52, but the thing is, is that it did, it did a lot of good things for, for the Bat family and their interpretations of characters. Like, I don't know too many people that are asking for this version of Jason Todd back. Yeah, Great Value Rorschach over here is, uh, is what a boy looked like for a little while, so, uh... I, I'm, I'm willing to admit that the new 52 was justified in some areas. What do you guys think? Do you guys prefer the modern, nicer interpretation of Dick Grayson, or do you prefer the pre-new 52 version where he's kind of a dick? So, while I've talked in the past about direct and specific reasons about why I don't like the new 52, I don't think that I've ever really addressed why, as a fandom, the new 52 gets so much hate. So, I'm gonna use this video as a chance to do that. So, the new 52 was not dissimilar to many other crisis level events that DC had done in the past. Usually, when stories start to become a little bit too convoluted or the writing gets too much, uh, DC decides to completely reboot their whole universe. Or, a better way is to, is to like, half reboot their universe. Think Crisis on Infinite Earths or Infinite Crisis. It is basically just a really big retcon event that lets them tell the origin stories of characters again and then get back into their stories, but now with a little bit of altered history. Usually it was used to either clean up the universe or make new readers jumping into the characters have a good starting point. The thing with the New 52, however, is instead of slightly altering the universe and then jumping back into the old stories again, they started from scratch. In the middle of multiple ongoing series, in the middle of a bunch of books, the DC Universe was just hard reset to a completely new beginning. They also changed the number of books being released and reduced it down to 52 books only being released. In theory, this would make more sense, especially because the New 52 had a pretty direct art director. When it started, the New 52 was pretty directly based off the art of Jim Lee. So a brand new jumping on point for the universe for new readers to jump into, a pretty distinct art direction based on one single artist, a bunch of new writers being brought in to actually head up these books, and the books being reduced down to only the books that DC thought people would want to read. That sounds like a perfect set up for the universe. So why is it pretty universally hated now? Well, a few reasons. For one, that reduction in characters and changing of writing meant that a lot of characters that were like fan favorites either got completely erased or unbelievably changed. Barbara Gordon is a character that went immense character development coming to terms with her disability and learning to live with it and become a arguably better hero because of it. But because they wanted a Batgirl book in the New 52, they completely undid that. Now she has a robot chip in her spine, she can walk again, she can be Batgirl. Other things were affected by time compression. The New 52 started by saying that superheroes had only really existed for about 10 years at that point, but somehow Batman already had all four Robins. And that highlights another issue. Yes, I said four Robins. Stephanie Brown was not included because that story was written out of canon as were a bunch of stories, and nobody knew which ones were and weren't. Certain character relationships were almost permanently altered. Superman and Lois's relationship was so meddled that they needed to just kill off that version of Superman and bring in the one from before the New 52 to fix it. On top of all of this, there was barely any internal memos at DC to actually inform other writers about what was canon and what wasn't or what other writers at DC were doing in their books with certain characters. So while, yes, individually, there might have been some good stories, on the whole, it really damaged the DC universe completely. Every event that has happened since the New 52 has been trying to undo parts of it in some way. And this wasn't even all the reasons. So yeah, hope that helps. No Nuance November Part 1. Stan Lee is not a credible source. But he's right, though. Oh, I'm gonna get some flack for this one. So go back and watch the original video. He makes an amazing point. I just want to elaborate on it a little bit. Above all else, Stan Lee was two things, a salesman and a storyteller. And sometimes the truth just doesn't make that good of a story. There are tons of articles online from former Marvel staff of the fact that Stan Lee would give approval for a comics decision and then immediately backtrack that to the public the second it wasn't positively received. The two things that come to mind immediately is Iron Man's nose and Gwen Stacy's death. For a while in the 1970s, Iron Man's mask was drawn with a triangular nose on it because Stan Lee made an offhanded remark while walking by one of the artist booths one day. It was just something like that. His face looks kind of weird, just completely smooth like that. You should probably give him a nose to even out his face. Mind you, Stan Lee's a writer. He's not an artist. But if Stan fucking Lee tells you to do something, you fucking do it. So Iron Man started to be drawn with a nose. And fans didn't like it. They said it made his face look weird. And Stan... Agreed. 
said he would have never made that decision in the first place and told the artist to get rid of it. And Gwen Stacy's death was basically the same fucking story. Said it was a good idea, greenlit the idea, fans didn't like it, he immediately said he would have never done that. I know that the image of Stan Lee in the public eye is like Happy Comics Grandpa. And don't get me wrong, he's an amazing fucking person. The man was an amazing storyteller and co-created one of the largest comics empires of all fucking time. Don't take this as me bashing Stan Lee, this is just me adding a little bit of, of truth to the pie. Because I think another thing that people forget about is that Stan Lee co-created a lot of the Marvel characters. A lot of people aren't aware that in the early days of Marvel, they subscribed to a comic making method called the Marvel method. This is a method where the writer and artist would sit down and come up with a draft of what would happen in the next issue. Or even to like start a character, they would sit down and they would come up with a basic outline of what's going to happen. The artist would then take this basic outline and draw the comic based on that basic outline. That drawn comic would then be handed back to the writer who would then script it out according to the panels drawn. Meaning that most of the artists that Stanley worked with deserve at least a portion of the credit for creating them. Which, given later in the year, Stanley started crediting his artists more. But there's a reason that we know names like Stan Lee and Bob Kane and not Jack Kirby and Bill Finger. The salesman usually gets the credit, and very rarely do they actually toss some of that back. Jack Kirby died in 1994 with absolutely no copyright rights to any of the characters that he co-created. Again, I'm not saying you shouldn't like Stan Lee. I love the man. He helped form my fucking being as I am right now. All I'm saying is that you should probably take everything that he ever said with a grain of salt. Like I said, first and foremost, the man was an amazing storyteller and salesman. You see that? See that right there? Yep. That would be my reputation flying away, because I just spent almost three minutes talking shit on Stanley. I make good decisions. I am gonna get fucking crucified! You know? You, you know, that just might work, actually. And I mean, DC has all these other properties that they also have, uh, that are actually really financial viable, that, that a lot of people really do enjoy, so... Honestly, this could be a really good way to actually work in those characters and maybe have those characters be the villains that actually started the New 52. That could, that could really work. Hey, we should talk to DC. We should get somebody on that. So that could have gone, um, better. Okay, so I kid, but yeah, actually that, that's essentially the plot of Doomsday Clock. In the story, it is revealed that the universe that Dr. Manhattan said that he was going to go and create at the end of Watchmen was actually uh, the New 52. And instead of fully creating a new universe, he took an already existing one and manipulated it and kind of used it as a testing ground to see what would happen if he changed certain things. DC kind of used this event as yet another kind of soft explanation and writing off of the New 52, as well as an opportunity to write the Watchmen characters into the canon of the DC universe. I will admit flat out, I didn't fucking read this book. I kind of, I just, I just want the, the, the Watchmen characters to stay in their own, stay in their own fucking lane. And honestly, absolving Barry Allen of the guilt of starting the New 52, I feel kind of undermines the point of Flashpoint. By the way, that's actually how the New 52 started, is when Barry Allen went and caused the Flashpoint universe, when he tried to undo it, he didn't get everything right. There was still, uh, like, time waves caused by him breaking the universe, and that is what caused all the changes. As well as merging the normal DC universe with the Vertigo universe. To a certain extent, but not complete. They never really completely explained it because it's the New 52, so of course they didn't. Anyway, yeah, uh, Doomsday Clock is one of those stories that I class right alongside, like, three Jokers where I don't actually consider it canon, nor do I really acknowledge what it says as canon for Watchmen either. I think giving a concrete sequel slash ending to Watchmen also kind of ruins the point of Watchmen. Also, if I got anything wrong about Doomsday Clock, feel free to correct me in the comments. I Again, I didn't fucking read it because I don't want to. I don't. I by no means think that it's bad. I, the, the art in it is fucking amazing. It's just one of those stories that I don't, I don't really want to read. So, like, if I got anything wrong, please correct me. But hey, to the original commenter, apparently you should go into writing comic book stories because apparently your ideas is already good enough to be put to page. All right, guys, I got a question for you. What is the most unique thing that you've ever made for a cosplay? I'll go first. So back around 2015-16, me and my parents went to Emerald City Comic Con, a pretty annual tradition until, you know, the panorama hit. That year, we all decided to go as the recent Thunderbolts run. That's my dad, my mom, my uncle, and that one down there is me. But you see, the Punisher skull that the Punisher has in that comic book run is very unique. It's like this squarish design and it's bright red. It's not really something that you could just find online. And instead of, you know, doing the normal people thing and just, you know, painting a Punisher skull on a shirt, we decided to do, uh, this. 
This is a solid steel Punisher skull that you can strap onto your body. There's a strap in the back that connects it so you can like twist it with your body too. Excuse the fact that there's little free hanging harnesses here. Usually they attach to these, but the version of these that have the little clips on them, I took to my apartment to use in my Red Hood outfit. So you're just gonna have to deal with the droopy skull. But yeah, segmented solid steel Punisher skull. What about you guys? What's your thing? Guess who stopped by his P.O. box again? I still have the best fans. Wanna see why? Let's go see why. So there's no tag on most of these. Most of these just have like the person's first name. So if this is you, please call yourself out. First off, we have Jessica who sent me like a little fucking, it's, it's plush panda red hood. Like, seriously, the, the helmet comes off and it's a ti it's tiny me. This little dude is fucking adorable and I am going to be putting him just right on my deck. This, this is fucking awesome. As he even has a little mohawk. That is just, it's just, it's so good. All right, next up, shout out to Mar Marisola? Is it, is it, is it Marisola? I, I don't know. Marisola. I'm gonna go with that. If I'm wrong, correct me in the comments. But apparently Marisola was not happy about the, uh, the version of Bane that I decided to cosplay because now I have both versions of the mask. It even ends like at my neck where his mask is. This is so cool. I'm gonna take this off before I get called out for cultural appropriation. Alright, shout out to Olivia for doing what is essentially a novelization of one of my skits. This is like actually a novelization of the dramatic skit that I did with Alfred and Jason. It's more focused on Alfred and like a third person perspective. It's so good. This is so cool. And honestly, you picked up on shit that I didn't think people were going to pick up on that skit. It's a good fucking job. This is super dope. All right. And for our only at of the day, at Sutton Cat, uh, apparently was on my Twitch streams and heard how much the Australia fucking scares me. I love you guys. All of my fans in Australia, I fucking love you. You guys are not the problem. The problem is that I'm pretty sure that the landmass that you all live on is an actual portal to hell. Anyway, Sutton Cat decided to send me a down under box. This is like filled with a bunch of snack food from Australia. This is so fucking cool. Somebody get me a ticket to Australia Comic Con and I'll come down to- I'll, I'll get over my fear if this is the shit y'all got. Oh, and one other thing arrived in my P.O. box that I bought for myself that I put a little teaser on on Twitter and Instagram, so you guys should probably go check that out because I'm not going to show it here. I'll just say, um, look out for something coming in the future. All right, again, I fucking love you guys. I have the best fucking fans. This is so cool. All right, thank you guys. I'll see you next time. So currently I am getting ready to do my Destro cosplay, uh, and I'm about to put in the stuff that's gonna make me age about 30 years and 10 seconds. Wish me luck. Oh, and welcome to the behind the scenes of the Destro video. Is, is this it? Is, it? is this a Jason Todd look? Is that the look y'all wanted me to take? When I posted the initial preview of the gray hair on Instagram, everybody said I should be dyeing my beard as well, which like... My facial hair is red. I did. I did put it in my beard. Like from like this line down, I look like Roy Harper. I know this is probably not gonna help the fact that most people think I'm way older than I actually am. All right, that right there is about as much work as I'm willing to put in for a three minute video. I might just end up being one minute. I'm not particularly sure. You know, I don't know what's funnier, the fact that I'm doing this for a video that can almost be classified as comically short, or the fact that I literally am going out tonight and I'm gonna have to wash all of this off in like an hour. All right, everybody, we're going to do Deathstroke a favor right now. We're going to ignore his uh, his love handles because apparently Deathstroke is also a college student and loves eating out a lot more than he loves going to the gym. People want to kill less people since the pandemic started, all right? Apparently distance really is the best answer. Do I look a bit like Slade Wilson? Yes. Do I also look a bit like Solid Snake? We're not going to talk about it. So I can't move the camera right now because technically I haven't filmed the first shot of the video yet because I forgot to film it before actually, you know, putting on all this shit. But honestly, I have no idea how he transforms very quickly because this is like 15 layers. This shit sucks. Taking off all of the straps feels like I'm finally allowed to be fat again. This is how Victorian women must have felt when they took the fucking corsets off because Jesus Christ, I can breathe. If you want to know how hot this suit is, my fucking calves were sweating under those boots. I didn't even know your calves could sweat. It is the middle of fucking November. How is this hot? Okay, I've taken off all of the bits that are not absolutely 100% required for TikTok Tino keep my video up, so now it's time to go wash all this shit off, so I'll be right back. Alright, I'm back. I'm normal. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Did I just get back from taking a fill-in-the-blank 42-question no-notes-allowed quiz? Yes. Did trying to memorize 250 slides worth of historical information, most of which was in different languages, fry my brain worse than Injustice Superman staring Shazam in the face? <laughs> How's my sleep schedule? That's none of your fucking business. It, it, it's bad. It could, it could honestly be, be quite better. With all of that in mind, including the fact that I'm running off of about two jack-in-the-box tacos, two and a half hours of sleep, a rock star, and a five-hour energy, am I still wanting to go to the gym tonight? Why am I like this? What the fuck? College life, baby! Woo! All of that to say, 
uh, I need a little decompressor and to laugh a little bit. So, welcome back to Regrettable Superhero of the Week, the weekly, not weekly show where I pick one character from the League of Regrettable Superheroes and then I run him the fuck down. Let's pick our superhero. All right, who do we got today? And you. Iron Skull. That is a dope-ass name. Jesus Christ. However, I will say that this man is cursed with the scariest fucking face imaginable. Why do your eyes look like that, bro? What the fuck? This looks like the hate baby of the Submariner, the original Human Torch, and an ant. Okay, so it's less Human Torch in Submariner and more like Human Torch in Robocop? Created by Carl Burgos, appearing in Amazing Man number 5, published in 1939, the Iron Skull is a former soldier who was injured to an extent that most of his body needed to be replaced with metal substitutes. They specified that, that his skull was replaced, and that comes into effect later. Anyway, much like Frankenstein's monster, once they were done, he got up and he looked fucking terrifying. They describe it as him looking like the living image of a skeleton, so I'm imagining with all the metal parts, he probably looks something along the lines of like the T-100. Something like this. And their way of covering up for the fact that he looked like a monster out of a sci-fi movie was a lifelike rubber suit. Yeah, he uh... He doesn't stand out at all. By the way, that's not just a weird way to draw his nose. That mask literally does not have a nose. It's just a cutout. Did I also mention that we never actually see this origin story? Did we learn all of this through an introductory caption in just one of his issues? Anyway, the Iron Skull stories takes place in the far off future of, um... 1970. The future is hilariously inconsistent in these books. Going from like high, high sci-fi Buck Rogers shit to just America in the 1940s everywhere forever. So you know, hell. The Skull's powers are basically anything he fucking wants. Flying, super strength, telepathy, you name it. They come and go, but the one consistent power is that his head is hard as a motherfucker. Basically uses his head as a bludgeoning weapon. Which I mean, look at that fucking brow line, I don't blame him. They don't really give a reason as to why he's fighting crime. Apparently the horrific beings that crawl their way out of the uncanny valley, gnashing their teeth and flailing their limbs, just have, you know, inherently good souls. Look. Look at how well this artist draws faces, and then look at this creepy motherfucker! Also, apparently for a while he sported a skull ring, kind of like this one. It would leave an impression of a skull on whoever he punched, which is just... D directly stolen from the Phantom. Anyway, this character just kind of fizzled out. They tried to revive him in the 1990s, but, uh... When, when this is your source material, you don't have much to work with. This one is definitely not the worst, but also he, he definitely lives up to the regrettable namesake. <laughs> You know, sometimes I forget how fucked my sleep schedule is until I decide to, um, go and work out to de-stress from all the homework that I'm doing, and, uh, I'm the, uh, the only person in my 24-hour gym. I'm gonna do five sets of squats, and I'm going to do each one on a different rack just because I can. I'm capturing a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for anybody who has been in a gym before. This has never been photographed on camera, but this is a full rack of free weights. About to commit fucking heresy. I'm using one of only four bench press racks to do literally anything other than bench press. And there's nothing anyone can do to stop me. Okay, but in all honesty, that took like four takes. My arm is so fucking tired. You know, very rarely do I actually show my jock side on this app, so this is just... This is fucking surreal. I know I said I don't want to get in Jason Todd shape by the new year, but uh, I don't know if you knew this, but legally, Taco Bell does not actually count against your diet. Another thing you might not know, uh, Cinnabon Delights are actually the cure for depression. It's scientifically proven. It's true. Don't ask me to cite a source. It's, it's true. Just it, trust me on this one. Learn something new every day. Anyway, welcome back to Regrettable Superhero of the Week, the weekly, not weekly show where I pick one character out of the League of Regrettable Superheroes and then I run the fuck down. Who do we have today? You. Mother Hub. Um. So... So I don't mean to discriminate on, on appearance, but that looks like a fucking villain. She was a witch! You're gonna tell me I'm wrong? Ah, oh, my hero! Oh, Jesus Christ! She literally has fucking fangs. Okay, the creator of Mother Hubbard is not listed, but she appeared in Scoop Comics number one in 1941. And yeah, this is just old Mother Hubbard, like the nursery rhyme. Is she a witch? Nobody fucking knows! And apparently her dog just doesn't fucking exist, which was like the whole point of the rhyme, but what the fuck? Okay, so get this, Old Mother Hubbard fights one of two things, either supernatural threats like gnomes and trolls and ogres and that sort of thing, or the, the, the Empire. Hydra's Bavarian stepbrother. The toothbrush mustache squad. Fans of fucked up windmills. You get what I'm saying? It was the 40s, everybody was fighting them. Imagine, you're just fighting in the trenches in the middle of fucking Poland or something, and all of a sudden, the Wicked Witch of the East with scurvy flies over on a goddamn broom, crop dusting your ass with dragon's blood. I assume followed immediately by like, the Human Torch and the Submariner and shit. Anyway, speaking of the dragon's blood, yeah, her cupboard isn't empty in this version. It's, it's very full, but it's full with like, uh, arcane shit? Just that I can see here, we got 
bat claws, madman's blood, siren's lure, dragon's blood. Honestly, a concerning amount of blood for a good guy to have in their cabinets. Yeah, they straight up say that she uses black magic to fight her bad guys. Which, by the way, are gnomes that suck the souls out of children through their ears. What the fuck is this fucking character? Did I also mention that she only speaks in rhyme? Wait a goddamn minute. Yellow skin, the magic, the cape, the fucking fangs, and the fact that she only speaks in rhyme? Guys, I think Mother Hubbard is just Etrigan the Demon's grandmother. Okay, but all jokes aside, Mother Hubbard actually does have some superpowers. She could biologically sense crime. And I quote, <clears throat> My nose is twitching, my blood runs cold, tis sign of pending crime I must unfold. Now my crystal I unseal to ferret out the crime I feel. Once again my bones start to creak to find the crime, I'll take a peek. She's talking about a crystal ball, she also has a crystal ball that senses crime. My question is why specifically crime? It's such a specific word to choose. You can sense the breaking of law in your bones. Is it based on any specific country? Is it just in the country that she's in? If she senses, I don't know, a gnome tempting someone to fucking jaywalk, she's just gonna fly out of the goddamn sky and just dive bomb you with siren's lure or some shit? This character's fucking wacky, man, I don't know. She appeared in three stories and then was reprinted a bunch and then disappeared into the fucking ether. So watch out for the next big comic event that's gonna be centered on her. So, for those of you who don't follow me on Twitter, by the way, if you want to hear me bitch and moan about just, just shit in general, go follow me on Twitter. Anyway, for those of you who are not on there, uh, I am actually in the finals month of my college at the moment. One of the beautiful things about being a video game art student is that all of your finals are projects, all of them take a long-ass time, and all of them are constant crunch. Unless you're a lighting artist, and then you can gain an entire TikTok following in the time it takes one fucking build to load! Wait, there's a preview of the game that I'm working on. I'm the lighting artist on it. Anyway, so with all that said, welcome back to Regrettable Superhero of the Week, the weekly, not weekly show where I pick one character out of the League of Regrettable Superheroes and then we run him the fuck down. All right, I've already done this two times and I got fucking B-Man and Mother Hubbard. Let's try this shit again. All right, who are we going to get today? You. Professor Super My We already did you. I flipped through this book like six times and every single time I flipped to a character that we have already fucking covered in this series. We are going to keep going until we get a new one. Who are we getting? Give me someone new. You. Fucker. You know what? Just gonna open the book. We're gonna open the book. It's gonna be simple. We're gonna open the book. All right, just you. Fuck. Who are you? Fantoma. Okay, what the fuck is it with these female superheroes looking terrifying as fuck? Last week we had Mother Hubbard, and now we got fucking Skeletor in a wig. Ah, hey man, I know the power of grace girl grants you many things, but does it grant you immunity against my raw sex appeal? Okay, no shit. Being fully serious here. This is actually the first female superhero in comic books. She beat out Wonder Woman by more than a year. Created by Fletcher Hanks under a pen name in Jungle Comics number 2 in February of 1940, Fantoma is basically a god. The closest comparison that I can give is basically the Spectre, except her punishments aren't ironic, they're just insane. She's just a miraculous blonde lady that lives in the jungle that can deal out terrible punishments to people who do bad shit. In a resting form, she looks like this, and when using her powers, she looks like this. Honestly, if that's the exchange rate for godlike powers, that sign me the fuck up. Turn me into shitty Ghost Rider with a mohawk. That'd be badass. Anyway, yeah, there's a surprisingly lack of information on this character. There's a lot more on the creator. Yeah, Fletcher Hanks is apparently a pretty notorious character. While consistently giving pretty stiff and rough artwork, he would also give all of his characters basically omnipotent power. His stories read more like weird morality tales than anything else. His characters consistently used their godlike powers to just give weird and very specific powers punishments to people. Take for instance Fantoma. One of her punishments is that she left someone on a dinosaur infested asteroid. There was a couple of jewel thieves in her jungle. You want to know how they got punished? You ever read I have no mouth and I must scream? She turned them into basically grasshoppers mixed with dandelions. She took out a squadron of military bomber planes with living sandstorms filled with flying lions. This dude's a thief. You want to know what she does to him? She traps him in a dormant volcano with these things says, guess what? Evolve, bitch. He's gotta just become one of these dudes. Because she will never let him leave, ever. Because, you know, he steals things. So he wears a penis hat. Yeah, Fantoma's fuck- <sighs> Come on. There we go. <clears throat> Alright, what is for breakfast? Lunch today. Ah, perfect. So unless my sleep schedule is way more fucked than I thought it was, uh... Yeah, it's still November. Welcome to No Nuance November. 
I'm willing to explain myself if I feel the need to do so, and or I feel passionate enough about the point that I feel that I have to. Also, it's totally okay if you disagree with me. This is all just my opinion. Also, if you disagree with any of my points, you're wrong! Ah, let's get started! Shit tastes like death and deadlines. Alright, Mark Strong is an incredibly intimidating and amazing actor that could absolutely be any villain he wants to be in the DCEU. However, he was completely wasted as Dr. Ivo because he should have been Lex Luthor. My evidence? Fucking look at the guy. I mean, other than the eye color, he basically looks exactly like him already, and every superhero movie in existence has shown that they don't give a fuck about eye color. Point number two, Jason Momoa is an amazing Aquaman, and the fact that he was such an amazing Aquaman made that character relevant for the first time in forever, but he was miscast because he should have played fucking Lobo. This is a candid photo of Jason Momoa on just a fucking Wednesday. And this right here is a picture of the main fragment man himself. And yes, I am not actually lying. This is a different photo. In fact, this is not even real. No, I, I promise, I'm not lying. Stop typing the fucking comment! Collar been this low the whole time? You guys don't get that much skin. Those thirst traps as characters who shouldn't be sexualized. About to drop a hot take so universal that it's basically ice fucking cold. Batman works better when he has the Bat Family. However, Batman is not the least interesting part of his universe. There is a lot of interesting stories that could be told with him alone. However, he is way more interesting when he has an entire family of people to bounce off of. Personal hot take, I find Hal Jordan boring as fuck. Evergreen Lantern is Jon Stewart, followed almost immediately behind him by Alan Scott, followed immediately behind him by Guy Gardner. Fucking fight me, he's an interesting ass character. Followed less closely because he's kind of boring as well by Kyle Rayner, and then Hal Jordan doesn't even make the fucking list. Sinestro lists above Hal Jordan. Wally West was better before the New 52 where he was allowed to be a fucking legacy character. Mr. Miracle and Big Barda need to be as much as a household name as Clark Kent and Lois Lane. Jason Todd's origin was better when it was Superboy punching the fucking universe that brought him back to life. Don't get me wrong, I love the whole League of Assassins, League of Shadows, Talia al Ghul thing where they fucking go and drop him in the Lazarus pit, but do it like they did in the Lost Days where they're just doing that so that he can restore his memories. Because honestly, it's so much funnier that the most realistic death in the Bad Family gets undone because the superheroes are at their shit again. The costumes with the trunks on the outside look better from an aesthetics and a color perspective. Red Robin suit with the cowl is fucking badass. It's the perfect extrapolation of a Robin slowly becoming their own Batman figure while wanting to stay unique from Bruce. Is that enough? I, th I, th I think that's enough. I got assignments to get to. It's five hours later. I totally forgot that I even recorded this. I just realized that I hadn't recorded anything today. So, uh, y'all want to see what I've been working on? For those of you who don't know, when I'm not doing, like, comic book stuff, I'm a video game artist in training. I'm going to school for it. I'm in my second to last semester. Just want, just want one more to go, and then, then I can sleep again. Anyway, this is the thing that I've been working on for my portfolio project for the semester. This is a little custom Maneki Neko cat that I made as well as a couple of variations on textures for him, so he can go from gold to black or white. He exists in just like this fucking void of despair, but it's got really nice lighting that I did right here. And just in case you were wondering, even for a simple scene like this, this is all the stuff that has to go into just making this look the way it does. Oh, and I also made it so it could do this. It's probably not great that I find this so satisfying, just... Oh no, our model, he's broken. Oh, this carnage is completely procedurally generated, so it's different every single time you shoot him in the goddamn face. Yeah, that's what I've been doing instead of, you know, that. Sleeping. Just, just more Alright guys, that is going to be it for this month. I just want to take a moment to thank all of my wonderful, lovely patrons over on Patreon. Alicia Vandekop, Allison Knopp, Anna Sauls, Ash Dolworth, Brandon Laney, Cassie Pace, Chaz Masters, Cody Kodak, Cyberwolf, Danny Walker, DeCassowary, Diandra, Dragonfang, Dustin Brothers, Gas Boss Gatelight Girl Keep, Justin Smith, Jenny Chanti, Cat Stevens, Christina Odd, Linda Mackert, Magu, Mary Baldwin, Matthew Church, Mel, Pandora A, SC Grin, Shannon Lindsay, Spring, Tarara, The Fire Branded, Theresa Harrison, The Rider of Darkness, Tyler Bryan, and Victor Veerall, as well as all of my other wonderful patrons over on Patreon. I just want to apologize, guys, for getting this out, like, two months too late. School has been an absolute bitch this last semester, so it's my final one. At least I just have one last semester, and then 
we're not gonna have to worry about uh, four months delays on my uh, on my videos again. So thank you guys for sticking with me. Thank you guys for being so absolutely and lovingly patient. And if you want your name read out in the credits of all of my videos, go ahead and jump on over to my Patreon and donate $15 or more. Or if you just wanna be nice, donate any amount, even $1 helps. All of this happens because of your guys' generosity. So thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for sticking around and I will see you next time.